So now we're actually going to build off of what we looked at in the last couple of videos. Um, I'm a little off where I was because it turns out my camera malfunctioned just a moment ago. So I've been talking to myself in my classroom for the last 10 minutes or so. But let's get caught up. So we were introducing drag force. We've already talked about it in a couple of other videos here. We know that there are a couple different equations for it. The more realistic one, especially for things moving at high speed through air, is the force of drag will be equal to some constant for the things that you're looking at, B, times the velocity squared. There's a heavy dependence on how fast you're going, and it is not a linear relationship. However, if you are dealing with low speed objects, things say falling through water, or things like our little coffee filter where it slows down pretty quickly and its terminal velocity is pretty low, then we can approximate it pretty easily to be a different B, per se, but it still represents the same thing, times how fast it's going. Pardon me? Terminal velocity. This is an important idea that we're going to incorporate. You do not necessarily have to incorporate it in the way that I'm about to show you, but I do things a little bit extra because there's a few things that we get out of it, and we'll see as we go through. But terminal velocity happens when your drag force is equal to your force of gravity. So when they equal one another, our acceleration goes to zero, and we reach our final velocity. It's the idea behind a parachute where you increase your drag force by getting a larger b so you can keep the velocity, the speed, lower. All right, then we looked at dropping an object off of a cliff, and we looked at what the acceleration was at the beginning, and finding the terminal velocity. We also went through, I threw a random number for the constant b at you, but it was laughably ridiculous because we got that the baseball would not move faster than a meter per second, which is just weird. Anyway, we then went through and used a far more realistic value of the terminal velocity for something like a baseball, even though it may not even be the real value. Again, you can check Google. And we found what a more realistic value for B would actually be. All right. Then we hit me talking to myself in a video that is now gone. We're going to talk about each of these things in a moment, but let's get things set back up. We're going to deal with a very low speed object. And we're going to do some calculus on this to find out what's actually happening. So if I drop this, it reaches a terminal velocity pretty quickly. So we're going to say that I'm dropping that, say a coffee filter. It is going to have a mass of m. It will be near the surface of the Earth, so it is subject to an acceleration due to gravity of g. But as we saw, it will not have an acceleration, a constant acceleration of g, because of the drag force on it. We're going to say that it has a drag, I'm going to call it coefficient, even though that's kind of stretching things a little bit, but it's going to be b, that's going to be our drag coefficient, is how I'm going to refer to it. And its value is, wait for it, b. All right, we're going to drop this from really high up so we don't have to worry about it hitting the ground before we see the end of things. We're also going to say that since this is a low speed one, we're going to say that the force of drag is going to be equal to b times v, and that's what we're actually going to solve. On top of that, we've already looked at a little bit of bv squared, so I'm going to take a look at this one instead and get it much closer to a real-life thing that we might actually model. All right. Of the other things that I want to introduce, let me jump straight to the chase. What I really want to know in this is what happens between the very beginning when the acceleration is g for just an instant to the very end-ish when it gets to a terminal velocity. One of the first things that I want to bring up is this. Let's define the terminal velocity. So normally it is written as a v sub t. I don't like that, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But the terminal velocity is going to be equal to, well, we know that it happens when the drag force is equal to the force of gravity, mg. So that will be b times v1 equals mg. I can also write that my terminal velocity is going to be equal to mg divided by b. Divide both of these by b. We are going to deal with this, and we are going to deal with this in part of our calculus work that we're about to do. I cannot emphasize this enough. You do not have to do it this way. Um, in some ways, I find it to be a little bit easier mathematically, though in the end, I don't think it actually is. When we get to the end, the way that I'm going to walk you through it we're going to end up with an equation that is much easier to understand what it's saying, and that's why I'm going to do a little bit more replacements than you might necessarily use elsewhere. 
What I really want is the following, and this is why I don't use V sub T for the terminal velocity. What I want is V as a function of T, V as a function of time. I want VT equals some stuff such that I could put in some value and it would tell me how fast it's going. So here's an example. V as a function of time might be 3 meters per second squared times time. At time equals 0, t equals 0, I would have v, t equals 0. This is actually where we get the notation for v naught, as a side note. We'd have 3 meters per second squared times 0 seconds. We'd end up with 0 meters per second. Our units must still work out. If I wanted to find out how fast it was going at t equals 2 seconds, then I could do v of 2. And that would be equal to 3 meters per second squared times 2 seconds. We would end up with 6 meters per second. This is a linear relationship. As time goes on, if I, well, as time goes on, basically I keep adding 3 meters per second every second. In fact, that's what this thing is saying. 3 meters per second per second is 3 meters per second squared. And this also happens to be our acceleration. What we've actually got here that I've written up is nothing more than v final equals v initial plus a t if v initial is equal to zero. Here's our acceleration, here's our time, and this would be our final velocity at some time. It's not always at one second, again, it's a notation, but that is more broadly what it represents. This is for a linearly increasing function save you a little bit of trouble. That's not what we're going to find with this. Our acceleration is not going to be constant. This was a kinematic equation that you get if acceleration is constant. And as we talked about before, our acceleration will not be constant because it's going to start at g and end at zero. So we need to do some calculus. Our kinematic equations won't help us. I want v as a function of t. So here's what I'm going to do. I draw my free body diagram, and I know at some time t, at any time t, we have the force of gravity down, and we have the drag force up. Now, they'll have various relationships. At time t equals zero, our drag force is actually going to be zero. And at time t equals a large number, though we don't know exactly what number, but as time goes on, eventually, our drag force will equal our force of gravity. But at any given point during the fall, my sum of forces in the y will look like this. My drag force minus the force of gravity will be equal to negative mass times my acceleration. This is Newton's second law. Now, I put a negative in here because I know if there is a non-zero acceleration, it's going to be downward. You're welcome to check one of the previous videos. I kind of explained that a little more in depth, but I mostly explained it there, so we're probably in good shape. This is the equation at any given point. We're relying on Newton's second law. Whenever you're dealing with drag forces and you're trying to do some calculus on it, Newton's second law is where you want to go. Apply Newton's second law on your problem, and we can easily turn this into the differential equation we need to evaluate it. On the AP exam, because that's partly what this video is for, for the AP exam, it is common for them to ask you, especially in a drag problem, to generate a differential equation that you can use to solve for, wait for it, v as a function of time. First step is Newton's second law, pretty much every single time, especially if you're dealing with drag force. If you're looking at the E and M side, there's a different way to set it up depending on what you're looking at, but for us in mechanics, it's pretty much always this. Many times they will ask you to simply write the differential equation and not necessarily solve it. And sometimes they'll ask you, after you write it, to then solve it. We're going to do both here. But if they ask you to simply write it, write out Newton's second law, and then replace these things. So we're going to have FD is BV minus MG equals negative M, and here is what turns it into a differential equation. DV DT. One of the things that we introduced in kinematics was that the acceleration is defined to be the time derivative of the velocity. Here is where we have the acceleration, so it is actually at all points equal to dv dt. This is actually the answer when they ask you to write the differential equation but not solve it. All you need 
is v, the thing that they want, velocity as a function of time, dv dt, and then everything else is constants. m, g, and b, those were all constants that were given to us. So when they ask to write but do not solve the differential equation, this is literally it. In fact, usually on the grading rubric, it's worth about three points or so. One point for setting up an appropriate Newton's second law, one point for bringing in the correct equations, uh, one for this, and one for the replacement of the acceleration to dv, to dv dt. So in many cases, this will get you a lot of points just being able to set this up. What we're going to do with it and why this is important, we're about to see. So I'm going to show you how to do the second part of this, which is solving for it and which will answer my original question, what happens to the velocity right after I let go of this thing? All right, here's where we're gonna bring in one other thing that I mentioned just a moment ago. Remember when I put boxes around these? We're gonna bring these back in. mg is also equal to b times our terminal velocity, okay? Both of these, in fact, all of these are constants. The mass is a constant, the acceleration due to gravity is a constant, b is a constant, and the terminal velocity is some value for this falling object. We don't know what that value is, but eventually it will come to that speed, that terminal velocity, and it will continue going at that speed the entire time until it hits the ground. So those are all constants. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do BV minus MG, except MG can also be said to be equal to BV final. My terminal velocity equals negative M dv dt. Now, I will freely admit, this might actually be making your life more difficult on the AP exam because terminal velocity was not one of the things that I gave you in the original setup, which means a proper answer cannot contain it. But we can always replace it later on with this one when we're done. Why I'm doing this is, I vaguely remember that it makes the math a little bit easier, though I could be wrong because we're dealing with constants either way. But I will point it out when we get to the end. By inserting this, we're actually going to be able to better see what the end result is. In just a moment, I'm going to check to make certain the camera's still going fine. Hooray! All right. Next thing we need to do, when we're actually working with a differential equation, when we want to solve for it, what we really need to do is we need to get all of, as many of the constants as we can, so constants, and dt on one side. And then we want that to be equal to all of the stuff that we're dealing with, in this case, all of the v's, and dv on the other side. Now I put v question mark because it will not always end up in the numerator. In fact, as we're about to see, it won't in this problem, and it's very common that it does not. It will end up in the denominator. But we want constants and dt on one side, and all of the v stuff with dv in the numerator on the other side, so that we can actually integrate it. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this equation, and the nice thing about this is I can actually divide both sides by b. I'm gonna move some of the constants over to the other side. I'm gonna do a little bit of algebra in my head. Feel free to pause the video and double check what I've got, but we should end up with something like this, negative b over m times dt equals dv over v, whatever the velocity is at any given point, minus v final, our terminal velocity. This is a constant, this is a constant, and this is a constant. This is a variable, v at some time t, and this is dt, and this is dv. Here's what we're going to do next. We are going to turn this back into a function of time by turning the dt into a t. We need to integrate. And for that, let's have a talk about what we're actually doing. Because one of my students, when I first showed them this, this technique, their immediate response, and it's a great response, was, oh, I get it. You integrate one side, so you integrate the other. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. No. This next part isn't necessarily important for you to understand to get the points on the AP exam, but I never like teaching a class to an exam. I want you to understand what you're doing. Integrating this side and integrating this side are two things that we have to do together, and to understand that, we're going to take a look at what a derivative is. Now, hopefully in class, I've tried to get this idea across to you, but we've got v as a function of time. 
I'm going to generate a graph here of velocity versus time. And let's say that that graph looks like, well, this. This is not what it actually looks like, but I'm just drawing a nondescript crazy town graph. Think about what you do when you find a derivative. Let's say that we want the derivative at this point. Let's go with um, maybe right here. So I want to know what the derivative, the slope, at that point is. Now, what you're actually doing with a derivative, I want you to imagine this. We want to find the slope at that point. One of the things that we could do is we could start here and take another point here, and we could do rise over run for each of these, find the slope from these two edges. I have a delta v, a y, a height, this big, which goes from here up to here. So this is the blue. This is my delta v. I also have a delta t, my run, this is my rise, here's my run, from here to here. This is delta t. If I were to find the slope of this blue line, it would be equal to delta v divided by delta t. Some finite interval in the velocity and some finite interval of the time. Now, many of you may be thinking right now, Sanchez, that's a terrible way. That's not the derivative. That's not going to be the slope at all. We have some non-zero slope. And the random point you chose on there looks a lot closer to zero, although it could be any of the points anywhere in here. This is a way of approximating the slope, but it's a terrible way of approximating the slope. How do I get a better approximation of the slope? Well, what I can do is I can bring these closer in. What if I go from this point to, say, maybe this point? It's still not great. I would have a delta v of something like this and a delta t of something like this. But I would end up with a smaller interval of delta v and a smaller interval of delta t. Well, as we said, this looks pretty close to zero. I've got a blue slope here and a green slope here. Green is getting closer. I'm getting a better representation of what it is, but it's still a terrible representation. This is not very good calculus at all. What I need to do is I need to shrink this down to very, very close. Well, that might be something like this and like this. I end up with an even smaller delta v over delta t. But it will still just be an approximation. If I want to find the slope at this point, I need to not have a finite delta. I need to shrink this down because as I shrink down this and shrink down this, I get very, very close to the real value. What I actually need to do is I need to have something where I shrink this delta v down to the smallest thing that it could ever be. And we denote that by saying d. That's what d represents. It means an infinitesimally tiny little piece of whatever you're looking at. I'm no longer dealing with a finite delta v because that's way too big. I'm only getting an approximation for what my slope is. But if I can shrink this down to one point infinitely thin bracket and one point here, I end up not with delta v over delta t, but I end up with an infinitely small interval of v, not delta, but much smaller d over an infinitely small t. This is what that notation means. So many of my students, when I ask them what d means, respond, it's a derivative. That's not what it means at all. And the sooner you understand what this notation represents, the easier all of physics-based calculus is going to get. Because every single time when you're dealing with a d followed by something, it means an infinitely small little sliver of that. Now, when I take a derivative, I go from a finite length and I shrink it down to infinitely small. As I go infinitely small on this part, this gets shrunk down to be infinitely small. There is a relationship between v and t. As I make one smaller, the other must also get smaller. We went from this and this, down to this and this, and then this and this, and then finally the dot. So here's why I'm telling you this. Is this the slide we need? No, this is the slide we need. My student asked, oh, you integrate one side, so you have to do the same thing to the other. No, actually. 
What we're doing is, with a derivative, you shrink down from a finite distance down to an infinitely small. But remember, to undo a derivative, you do an integral. Why am I integrating both sides? Because they're both interrelated. If I need to expand dt from infinitely small back up to a finite value, remember, they both shrank down together, which means if I need to expand one of them, the other must also increase back to a finite value. Because they are related, there is a relationship between dt and dv. If I shrink one of them down, the other shrinks down too for our derivative. If I do the reverse and I want to expand one of them back out, the other must expand back out. This is why we integrate both sides, not because we're doing the same thing to both sides, but because they're interrelated. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to integrate from time equals zero to some time t. Now, just as a side note, because I do this from time to time, calculus teachers will point out that it is inappropriate for me to have as my variable of integration also a variable that is part of my limits of integration. That being said, we're just going to run with this. We're going to go from zero to some velocity at time t, however fast it's going at some time t. Well, b and m are actually constants, so I can pull them out. Negative b over m times the integral from 0 to t of dt equals the integral from 0 to v as a function of t, v at some time t, dv of v minus terminal velocity. Technically, these kind of represent the same thing. There's some velocity at some point that we're looking at. In particular, I want the velocity at time equals t. All right, I evaluate this. This is just the integral of dx, effectively. It's dt, because it's a time integral. But we end up with negative b over mt minus 0. My lower limit of integration would be, so this would be parentheses t minus 0. But I'm just going to ignore the minus 0, and we're going to keep moving. Equals, here's where we have to do a little bit of extra work. The integral from 0 to v at some time t. We're going to do dv v minus v terminal velocity, so our terminal velocity. Um, oh, dv, sorry. This shows up a decent amount. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use some u substitution. I'm going to say u equals v minus v terminal. Remember, this is a constant, so that means that du, with u substitution, is equal to dv. Great. I'm going to replace these a little bit. Here is the place where I was talking about the math gets a little bit easier if you're using u substitution. But we're going to integrate from 0 to v of t of du, which is dv, over u, which is v minus terminal velocity. Feel free to pause it and double check on that, but this is just regular u substitution. We end up with negative v over m times t equals du over u, that's going to be evaluated to the natural log of u divided, or um, not divided, evaluated from 0 to v of t. Now I'm going to switch u back to what it was, negative v over m times t equals the natural log of v minus v terminal, evaluated from 0 to v t. Here's where things can get a little bit tricky mathematically. There are a couple ways to deal with this, but this one is best done with rules of natural logs and uh, exponents. So I'm going to have natural log of, well, our higher limit is vt, v is a function of t, minus our terminal velocity, minus the natural log of 0, minus the terminal velocity. This is me evaluating my... Uh, integrals limits. You can also do this with an indefinite integral. At some point I will try and put together a video for that, but I usually like solving these with the limits of integration because they make me a little, little bit more comfortable. Uh, natural log, using the rules of natural log we can find that this will be v as a function of t minus terminal velocity over a negative v terminal velocity. I need to get rid of that natural log, so I'm going to take e raised to the both sides, and we end up with the following. e raised to the negative b divided by m times t equals v as a function of time minus the terminal velocity divided by negative terminal velocity. Multiply this over, we end up with negative v1 times e 
raised to the negative b over mt equals vt minus v1. And we are almost done. Add this over to the other side and we get the following. vt equals our terminal velocity minus the terminal velocity times e raised to the negative b over mt. I can finish this up. Although this is a perfectly good solution, not quite with the AP grading rubric, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but I can back, factor out the terminal velocity and I get 1 minus e raised to the negative b over mt. Let's see what this says. The biggest difference between how I did this and what you could possibly do to make it simpler is you don't have v1 in here. So the end solution would be this. Velocity as a function of time, way back up here, we know that our terminal velocity is mg divided by b. Your final answer would be this, mg divided by b times 1 minus e raised to the negative b over m times t. Let's see what this is actually telling us. So this would be the acceptable answer for the AP exam. But I put it in these terms for a couple of reasons, not the least of which being the following. At t equals 0, I want to know what the velocity is for this. Well, if t equals 0, I plug that in here. And e raised to the negative 0, well, anything raised to 0 is just 1. I would have 1 minus 1, which is 0. 0 times our terminal velocity, we find that v of 0 is actually equal to 0 meters per second, which matches our boundary conditions what's happening at the very beginning and the very end. Let's see what happens as we wait a very long time, as t goes to infinity. That's a fancy way of basically saying we're going to give it a lot of time. As t goes to infinity, in fact, let me write this in a different color so we've got it a little bit more visible. If we wait for a really long time, this one we checked what happened at the very beginning. If we wait a really long time, then this goes to infinity e gets raised to the negative infinity, so that's e raised to negative gigantic number. The limit of that will actually take this whole term to 0. 1 minus 0 is 1, and we would have the terminal velocity times 1. We find that the velocity, as time goes to infinity, in other words, a very long time, becomes the terminal velocity. What we end up with on this is we now see what the relationship is for our velocity. This is why I like writing it in these terms, because this is our terminal velocity. We would get mg over b, which is equal to the terminal velocity, but I like seeing it explicitly laid out here. Okay, so I apologize about that. I need to keep in mind that my camera will actually automatically shut itself off after a certain amount of recording, and we're reaching kind of a limit on that one. I'm going to fill in here real quick. Um, what happens to this graphically is the following. If we have v as a function of time, and we know that it looks like this. <coughs> Our terminal velocity times 1 minus e raised to the negative b over m times time. Another way of writing this is v of t equals mg divided by b times 1, one minus e raised to the negative b over m times time. Okay. I want to bring that up because technically these are the ones that were given to us in the problem, so a correct answer does not feature the terminal velocity unless that is something that is given to us in the problem. But in short, what it's saying here is we know at time equals zero, as we talked about, we start off at zero, and this has an exponential approach, an exponential decay is another way of writing that or expressing that. When you graph this, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. It starts off really strong, but then it kind of levels out. I didn't draw that as well as I probably should have. I apologize. But it will asymptotically approach some value here, getting closer and closer and closer. Now, for it to actually reach this asymptote requires time to go to infinity. So it will only approach that. So here's all that math stuff that you've learned. But this value, this starts off at 0, and then this value is at v1, although we were not given v1, so I'd probably be better off writing it as mg over b, which is equal to v1, our terminal velocity. 
What this is saying is we have something that starts off at a velocity of zero. It speeds up pretty quickly initially, but then reaches very close to terminal velocity. Now, the reason that it takes kind of an infinite amount of time to reach terminal velocity is think about what's happening here. We have two forces, the drag force and the force of gravity. And as the drag force gets big enough to match the force of gravity, as it gets close to that, our acceleration gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's rapidly approaching zero as these two start basically canceling each other out. Well, if our acceleration approaches zero, that means that our velocity changes ever so slightly because we're not speeding up that much at all. That's kind of the idea behind this. Technically, it requires an infinite amount of time for you to reach terminal velocity. In real life, we would say, I think it's somewhere around four or five, I'm sorry, five or six time constants is what I'll call it. We won't really go into that very much, but you could actually solve for the point where the velocity as a function of time is equal to 99.99%. Let me write that differently. 0 0.9999 of v final, our terminal velocity. Because by the time you actually find that, it's not equal to the terminal velocity. It'd be somewhere over here, for instance. But there's some time where it gets to be 99.99% of it. And since we usually only keep track of things to about three significant figures anyway, that's close enough for us. It turns out that there'll be a finite amount of time where we get so close to the terminal velocity that any regular person would actually just be measuring it as that. We won't be able to measure a difference that small. That happens in a finite amount of time. It depends on your scenario. We're not gonna look at that for this. However, I have some videos where we do something very similar in the electricity and magnetism side with circuits, and they use something called time constants. A lot of the calculus looks very similar, just kind of a different setup. And that's one where we actually look at the time so that we can draw conclusions based off of it. But the important thing is this, we have an exponential decay for our velocity under these circumstances, if it's a low speed one that has a force of drag of b times v. This is how you go through and solve these types of problems.